the world is evolving. People are starting to recognize that we got to keep up and we've got to figure out how we can service people more effectively. It's not to say that lawyers have not serviced people effectively from the start, but the times have changed. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Ao, venture capitalist, Sarah founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. HD Mall is a healthcare marketplace in Southeast Asia, connecting patients to over 1,800 medical providers. This covers multiple categories, such as dental, aesthetics, and elective surgeries. Over 300,000 patients have accessed more affordable healthcare via HD Mall. Get yourself a well-deserved health checkup. If you're in Thailand, go to hdmall.co.th. If you're in Indonesia, go to hdmall.id. Hey, Rachel, really excited to have you again on the show. We had a wonderful time, both on your previous time where you shared about your personal journey and also the second time where I was interviewed on your founder's doc on YouTube. So we placed a link there. It was a great conversation. And I was like, you know what? We have so many other topics to talk about. And so I wanted to kind of hear that again. So could you share a little bit about yourself for those who don't know you yet? Yes, thanks for having me back, Jeremy. I hope we had a good time at the podcast that we did together. My name is Rachel. I am a startup lawyer and I'm an entrepreneur. I wear many hats. I don't even know where to start, but I'm just generally having fun. Having fun with solving a couple of problems. The first problem that we're trying to solve is how do we improve internal legal tech solutions, i.e. how do we make the internal system of any legal service provider more efficient? How do we solve the kings that I typically see as inefficient? The second problem we're trying to solve is access to justice. I think previously we launched Founder Stock at a time when founders were not supported so widely. Now, a lot of lawyers want to support founders because they're seen as very cool, very profitable and, and whatnot. But at the time that founder stock was launched, founders were the people that most lawyers were not so keen to service. So we've solved that problem. And I think now it's no longer a problem. And now we're moving into the third stage of solving access to justice, which is how can we make legal documents, reasonably good legal documents available to more people at a reasonable price point. So that's something that we're working on this year. Amazing. So, you know, we were just joking that it's only a matter of time before you're featured on the cover of some magazine as a lawyer turned entrepreneur serving the startup sector. So I'm looking forward to that future. And before the article comes out, that will ask you how you became an entrepreneur, right? I want to ask you that question. I think we never dove into that, which is that there's a lot of people who are lawyers or at least they study for the bar and they become lawyers and then of course we know the story again the newspapers has the stories of lawyers who end up baking cupcakes or becoming a chef right you know so that's yes. the story of people who turn away from law but what's interesting is that you've taken law and you decided to become more entrepreneurial with it so on a podcast with business consulting so could you share a little bit more about what it is to be an entrepreneur in the legal context? Yes, I think the first hurdle that entrepreneurs in the legal space face is always regulatory hurdles because the legal sector in a lot of countries is highly regulated. So I mean, part of the process is trying to sense what the environment is. How do you explain to stakeholders what you're trying to do, whether you're aligned with the objectives that stakeholders want to achieve. So if you take, for example, UK versus another jurisdiction at this point in time, you can see that UK is actively promoting legal innovation. They are allowing law firms to IPO versus this structure is not available in a lot of countries at this point in time. So I think being in tune with the regulators is something that's helpful. And the second thing is perhaps the mindset, because I think the mindset of most lawyers is, hey, we want to follow precedent. And if you want to steer away from precedent, you have to justify why you're trying to do that. This is comes from the concept of learning case law and this applies both for US lawyers and common law jurisdiction lawyers. So the mindset is, hey, let's follow what we've been taught unless there's a reason for us to steer away from that. So there's also maybe a bit of resistance from lawyers sometimes to adopt technology too quickly because of the risk that they're going to be exposing themselves to. And it 
sort of steers away from our sort of training as lawyers to follow precedent. I think the world is evolving. I think people are starting to recognize that we got to keep up and we've got to figure out how we can service more people and how we can service people more effectively. It's not to say that lawyers have not serviced people effectively from the start, but the times have changed. In Singapore, for example, we are now servicing people who are much more highly educated. I'm always challenged by my clients. Oh, the chat GPT can produce the term sheet. So, you know, it looks great. So why should I trust you? So helping the consumers understand what are the risk factors they need to be aware of what they need to look out for and helping to justify the value that we bring on the table would be helpful. And when I'm talking about this set of consumers, I'm really talking about the small medium enterprises, the startups, the guys who are not so high up there in the sense that your, t- your typical DBS domestic still has a panel of lawyers that are very ready to service them. I don't think that legal service on their end has evolved too much. Although I do think that another trend that lawyers need to be aware of is the expansion of the in-house legal team. For example, Shell has thousands of lawyers. They are essentially maybe some people say they are like a law firm because they hire so many lawyers. So in this new era whereby we have increasing in-house lawyers, we have people who are more educated, we no longer have a monopoly over legal templates or legal knowledge. How do this new age of lawyers reframe how we value add to the industry? And that is important because at the end of the day, the reason why law and lawyers evolved was to increase access to justice and ensure that it's a semblance of justice in, in society. It sounds really odd because I think currently justice in society means access to information, access to full clarity on what's going on, full visibility, full transparency. And that's why we had the Web3 and crypto evolution that arose recently. But I think there's still a lot of goodness in having a very sound legal system that's governed by the government. And I think lawyers are part of that process. So how do we figure out this new jigsaw puzzle? It's something that we're all figuring out. Amazing. You know, I think there's so many different threads to pull on. I mean, one of like you said, is ChatGPT. You know, that's one. Two is, I think, in-house law. And third, I think, is I'll say the reaction of the legal society, I guess. Not just of yeah. legal society, but... The Society of Lawyers in terms of reacting to those changes, right? So I guess let's talk about the first one. So what are you seeing on the ground, which is people using ChatGPT to negotiate or discuss with you their legal process? What are you noticing about those? And how do you think that would change as well? Yeah, so I think what I'm seeing on the ground is many people using template from online. So ChatGPT, in my opinion, isn't that novel. Because before ChatGPT came about, there were people who would give me templates from online. They'd be like, okay, this is in English. It looks kind of right. Why can't I just use that? Which is very fair. And then I think that now with ChatGPT, what ChatGPT allows them to do is they can prompt ChatGPT like, oh, please take this template and amend this, you know, based on what we're discussing. So that is the evolution that ChatGPT has brought to the table, which is now they can, ChatGPT can be in the process of helping them amend the document. How do you think that's going to accelerate? I mean, for me personally, you just triggered my head that when I was a founder, I had to consult Brad Feld's book called Venture Deals to explain pro rata, right? And all these various, you know, term sheet deal terms. And then I literally would just ask like, is this more favorable towards me? And what should I negotiate mm. for, right? So that's what I was always trying to look for. I guess that's going to accelerate further. How do you do you think is? But I think term sheet is relatively simple, right? It's a structured document. It feels like maybe it applies to even more structured law in the future, like partnerships, contracts, employment agreements. What do you think about that as well? I think there's definitely a move worldwide towards plain English. So I mean, pro rata isn't something that you wake up as a baby and like, oh, I know what a pro rata is. <laughs> no, I so, did. I woke up in the morning <laughs> saying pro rata. That's my first word. Yeah. I looked at my dad. I said pro rata, you know. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Go yeah. So I think definitely there's a move towards using more plain English. I think even for me as a lawyer, there were times when I look at documents in different outside of the area that I am specializing in. And I'm like, I don't understand what this is saying. And we are now having customers who want to understand what is going on. So I think do think that we would have to stay away from using language like inter alia, ipso facto, which was very sexy in, you know, the 1950s and 1900. But now it's more towards the plain English movement, as well as helping the people who sign the documents fully understand what they're signing. So definitely a movement towards plain English. Second, whether or not there could be a more, a more standardization towards documents, I think we, maybe we can use the YC safe as an example. I never thought that there would be a document that people would just copy paste, copy paste, and use widely as a template in 
private negotiations where it is not mandated by the industry, i.e. in insurance and banking, there are standard template documents that the industry has decided that they want to use. But I think YC Safe is the, probably one of the few instances whereby I see a lot of startups and a lot of VCs recognizing that this is a document they want to use and then just using it as it is, without any sort of like top-down approach of saying, hey, you got to use this. So that for me is quite interesting. But then on the flip side, right, I also have startups who say, or VC funds who say, okay, we're going to use the YC safe, but we're going to have a site letter and the site letter is 15 pages long. Then it just kind of like bastardizes all the clauses in the YC safe. So I think humans, being humans, at the end of the day, they still want some of their intentions. They still want to flag the negotiating power they have on the table. So it's definitely better because more startups can just download the YC safe, fill in the stuff and then get it going. But at the end of the day, I think where the documents, where people want to reflect the negotiating power on the table or where investors want to have a bit more right, there's always that side letter that comes along with it. So yes, it's a very interesting evolution for me. I like the phrase bastardized YC save. Let's talk <laughs> into the incentives behind that. Because I've done both, right? I've been both the founder and user of YC save. And I've also been on the VC side writing side letter. So I think from my perspective is that on an objective basis, the YC save, especially the new version that came out that's primarily a post money save, has two major attributes. I think the first is that, first of all, it's very simple. And hmm. it doesn't give any control rights, information rights, or pro rata rights to investors, hmm. which is, I think, good from a founder perspective because you get more control in that sense. But it's bad for investors whose fund strategy and economics don't hmm. work unless you have those things. Like, hey, I need to know what's happening in my company <laughs> that I put money in. Hmm. I need to know and have the ability to put more money in the future into the company. But conversely, I think that the post money safe is also quite dilutive to founders because of the post money way it's done, which is an interesting design choices that YC need, which makes sense for economic model, which is as an right. accelerator, pushing out lots of folks and making sure that, I think they're optimizing for that spread of startups that they have, but doesn't obviously work for most VCs out there that are investing and mm -hmm. doesn't come across as something that's super obvious to founders about what they're actually signing. Because like you said, it's a default, yeah. safety numbers, it's easy, yeah. and I don't have to pay a lawyer like Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Until the site letter comes, right? Because all the investors are like, oh, we can't, we can do a YC safe, but we need a site letter. So yeah. I guess what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that's going to evolve further? Or how do you think those site letters are playing out from your perspective? Well, I think the evolution comes from the startup drying in capital. It's always a reflection of the economic times that we're in. So um, I think okay. in the past five years, we've seen a huge boom in startup where the negotiating power is on the startup founder. But now, to be honest, it's probably a very dry season. A lot of startup founders are wrapping up their businesses. And I think until the Fed reduces their interest rate and there's a new boom factor, this might continue for some time. But maybe from a statistical perspective, I do see the due volume dropping quite significantly. In terms of the terms that's being negotiated, I still see the YCC being used, but perhaps now the negotiating powers on the side of the investors and they would ask for either chunkier side letters or they might just go straight to having shares from day one. And just being very like talking in legal terms, the YC say actually hasn't been that bad for some of the investors because by virtue of the fact that they're not shareholders yet, they're yeah. actually debt holders, which means that they get the first rights technically when the startup starts winding up. So they're actually ranked higher than shareholders. At the end of the day, it kind of plays out I think there are two problems that still need to be solved. The first key problem is when startups enter into the price round, how we can sort of like figure out the terms of the shareholders agreement with some sort of like fairness amongst all stakeholders. Because some startups would sign like 15 saves and then there might be one safe holder which is like unhappy with the term that the lead investor won. Then how do we resolve these differences? Currently, the YC safe does not provide for that. The second one is on maybe information rights. I do think on your point, it is fair for them to have a bit more like quarterly updates at the very least when they right. in the safe insurance. And I guess that that one is the winding up. Currently, it's a bit unclear sometimes what to do when the startup is running low liquidity. So maybe a bit of 
provision and clarity over that could be helpful. Even though I see the difficulty, which is every jurisdiction has different winding up and insolvency processes. So it may be difficult for them to standardize these things across the board. But these are things that most startup founders won't want to care about. They're not going to care about doomsday. They're not care about, care about innovation. <laughs> and they're not going to care about the next price round because all they want to do is like, look, we just want to start building, 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 and then head towards a price round and all they care about is valuation. But then there are all these little details that crop up. On the flip side, though, I do see some of the guys who signed the YC Safe at Venice Asia is absolutely benefiting in a price round for the successful startup. So I think the YC Safe was always intended to be an economic benefit. So you put in 50000 100000 200000 at the understanding that I'm economically going to benefit very well if you guys move to the next stage. But it's also an instrument that is to be used by people with high amounts of liquidity. Like they're able to say, okay, $15,000 is the cost of my weekend meal. And right. if I lose it, I probably will not care and cry too much about it. Yeah, I think the awkward reality is that the instrument is better for some people and worse for other people, depending on what you want. So like you said, I think it gives you more protection on the downside to some extent, but it doesn't give you any of the control rights that you need. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. I think it's beneficial for angels as well because angels are not represented by legal counsel and they normally don't have the ability to do pro rata as well. But mm -hmm. for syndicates and for like professional VSCs, you know, the pro rata rights are really important to give them the ability to double down on a winning portfolio company. So what's interesting going to the second trend here is that you talked about change in the legal structure in society as well. So in my head, I think there's a bunch of legal tech companies. I think you can probably make an argument that Carter is taking out a domain that's quasi-legal in the sense that there's cap table management, which was historically done to some extent by lawyers, as well as the fund management side. And then you see kind of like all these legal tech platforms that pop up. And then you see, I think also large law firms consolidate as well. So how do you see oh. those trends happening? Yeah. I think the first trend that I sort of like maybe predict is that lawyers will become more specialized. Yeah. So I think it's a study that people have done as well, but industries evolve in a certain way, which is they first expand and consolidate and monopolize things. So to give an example, it will be like law firms doing mergers to become larger law firms and then being sort of a one-size-fits-all law firm. And then the industry then typically evolves to become more specialized. The underlying rationale behind it is twofold. The first thing is that economics kind of don't make sense at some point when they're too big. And the second thing is that the people, the consumers also require something a bit more specialized over time. They're no longer so open to generic lawyers, i.e. if I'm looking for maritime legal advice, I want to go to a maritime lawyer rather than going to a big shop that does everything. So that is the two sort of like evolutionary changes that I think I will be seeing. Yeah. And if I could just add a third, it's just the blur between the lawyer and the non-lawyer is going to be a bit more gray over time. Let's take wills, for example. Wills were typically done by lawyers, but now we see a lot of platforms doing wills as well. And these things have different implications in different countries. Some countries have taken the position that, hey, wills can only be done by lawyers. It's not something that the non-legal service industry can do. And then some people have taken the position that, no, this is going to be the other way around for my country. And then back to basics, I think wills is something that everybody should have a right to. I think there's a lot of practical problems trying to execute a will at the moment. So I definitely think this is a problem that needs to be solved. But these are some of the sort of like trends that I see. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a fair point about wills. I remember about 10 years ago, I went to do my will and I walked in and they were like, oh, what do you want? And then I was like, oh, I want that if I die, I want my internet accounts to be handed over to my sister. Then mm. the lawyer was like, oh, never heard of that before. How many accounts do you have online? I was like, 100, 200 accounts. 100. Like, face, like, just like, I mean, it's like, you know, Reddit, I don't know, Gmail, Facebook. And then the face changed. And I was like, anyway, we just gave up on the clause and I just you know, moved on with life because it was too novel at that point of time, yeah. the concept of that. But I thought it was an interesting realization in my head that it was a very, you know, like you said, old school way of, Turning up at the office, waiting for the person, explaining, getting thing, and then give me a nice will, and then they put a brown envelope, they put a wax seal yes. on top, and then now there's a lot of digital wills, right? Yes, and uh, I'm just gonna share with you before you do a digital will that wills still need to be wet ink signed with a witness. Yeah. So technically yeah. speaking, you can't do a digital will, which I think a lot of people do not know. They're like, "Ducky sign the will." Ducky <laughs> sign the will. The internet saw a witness. 
Yeah. yeah. But I think that's, that's interesting, right? So how else do you think the legal tech, I mean, I think there's legal tech that's happening through these, like they said, these platforms like Carter and Wills, like they're kind of hiving off the general stuff that's a little bit more templatized to some extent. And then how would execute that thing? But how do you think about technology being adopted by law firms? You know, because there's a lot of legal tech startups now that are like not trying to be direct consumer, but trying to be, I guess, B2B, B2B right? So mm. how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, they, I didn't get paid by them to say this, but I think one of the win cases of legal tech adoption is maybe this company called Litera. So they provide software tools for lawyers to draft. But I think they were very successful because either the person who founded it or the team that decided to design it, they got into the nitsy itsy details of what the lawyer really looks for. And it's really things that's not sexy. It's not things that you see Hardy Spectre doing on suits. It's Ooh. changing the smart quote to straight quotes. That yeah. kind of thing keeps us away. Making sure the clause references are updated, auto numbered, that kind of stuff. So I think Letera did a really good job in get sort of like easing the drafting process for lawyers. And the last I checked, they're doing quite well. But I think it's quite a number of other legal tech companies struggle. Maybe I can divide them into a couple of categories. The first category is legal tech solution providers that's driven by large law firms. So we've got the international law firms with a bit more of cash driving these processes locally. I mean, I think Raja and Tan has been a big champion of legal tech innovation as well. And I, I think this is definitely something that a space that needs to be watched because the traditional struggle has been the partners are not so open to looking at these technologies because they are used to doing work in a certain way. Just to sort of like lay down that process, it'll be like they receive a draft from their associate, they mark it up in, you know, maybe wet ink, and then you say, hey, put the changes through. This process, if you tell them to say, hey, you know, instead of marking up on a hard copy, can you now mark up on Microsoft Word? I think having spent 25 years marking out a hard copy, they'll be like, it's difficult for me to read and have that kind of attention to detail on a computer screen. So I'm not used to that. So that's one part of it, like inertia to change because I mean, these processes were things that have worked and they're like, you know, I don't want to try something new and then make a mistake. And then lawyers always get into a lot of trouble when they make mistakes. The second point is on technology innovation, right? So in the past, trying to build a maybe natural language AI model is very difficult. It's going to cost a lot of money. When I first started my training contract, I was like, I was doing a due diligence report and I was just like, this is impossible that we cannot run the documents to an AI and for them to tell us what which where the clauses are and we're manually looking for these clauses. But then the times have evolved such that now AI technology is very advanced. A lot of the technologies are plug and play. There is this new thing called no code automation yeah. or no code coding. So that is something that has helped legal innovation because no longer do you have to spend 50 million to go and figure out something. You can just plug and play these solutions. And just to sort of like wear the, the, the party hat is um, sort of like us working with uh, IMD, DM in law. There was a digital plan sort of like roadmap for lawyers in Singapore that they were trying to encourage lawyers to look at, which is to say that, hey, there are some legal tech solutions which we think are going to be helpful for your law firm. Maybe consider using them. So I think this evolution of, you know, both technology being more plug and play as well as then you know partners being more open to it because it's that simple to use it's not so complicated it's not going to cost me so much money these two changes i think it's going to accelerate the development of legal tech adoption in the industries the second group category i would say is the guys who are vc backed your typical startups which have backings through VC founders. I think the main issue was in the past, these companies sort of like didn't really understand the problem that lawyers were facing. So it's probably set up by a person who was in practice for two to three years. And then he's like, or she's like, you know, I do not want to deal with this nonsense anymore. I'm going to solve this problem. But sometimes it takes a bit more time to fully digest and understand the problem before you try to solve that problem. So what happened was that they proposed solutions, which kind of work, but didn't solve the problem enough to incentivize people to use it. Yeah, so the, the solution they provided were just too minuscule in improving our lives that there was no incentive to adopt it. But I do think that's changing as well. I think people are starting to understand and respect that, hey, if you want to solve someone's problem, you need to sit in their shoes and look at the, the world from their eyes. And that's evolving as well. And then I guess the third category sort of like evolution is the law firms themselves, not even setting up a innovation hub or anything, them trying to evolve and being a new type of law firm. And that's what I see in Australia. So in Australia, we have law firms who are trying to crack at things from a different perspective. They're trying to be more than a law firm sometimes. And these things, the 
legal industry as, as, as a startup industry has traditionally been one of the slowest, in my opinion. I think that will change in the coming years because of all these changes. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a you know local startup called Tesseract, right? And so the yeah. founder, she was previously on the Brave Podcast uh, that we'll link to here. Right. And she was talking a little bit about the legal tech side and some of these challenges. And the other side of it that I noticed is that you're right. I have met law firms and I've met innovation team hubs. And it's interesting because I was like, what's your job? And their job is like, we have to help our uh, lawyers source solutions, I guess, vet them, trial them, cascade them. So I thought it was quite interesting. I felt like it was one of the few times I met somebody whose job was just like Very that specific. type. Very specific, right? Because normally, I'm just saying... It's like you and I, our job is we have to do the work and we innovate at the same time. We don't split it up into two different people. Oh, um, oh. I mean, I always joke, tell, I tell people, I was like, if one person's job is innovation, that means your other person's job is conservatism, right? You know? I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the innovation hubs and the law firms, most of the time it's, yeah, they're trying to persuade the general crowd to use it. So the mindset has to be right. The mindset has to be one of like, hey, I, I want to try. But the other problem is when you're really in practice, you're kind of running against time all the time. Like the client was something yesterday, every day. So you don't really have that space or time to innovate or even yeah. try out the new tools. So I think that's a struggle, but I'm sure they'll figure out ways to overcome these struggles. On that note, I know that you are going to be launching a new product soon. So I'd love to hear what you're planning to do. Thank you. The new product is called FD Lite. I mean, just to explain the genesis of how this terminology came about, Founders Dog, which is FD, Lite, which is a lighter version of it. The whole idea is to lower the price point for access to legal documents and to make these documents more accessible to more customers rather than, you know, the guys who can afford to pay high amounts of legal fees. So in that sense, from that sense, we are serving a new market, i.e. people with, who are traditionally not going to be serviced by any lawyer. Now they have the ability to maybe consider using this as a potential solution. I think the first game changer about at the light is when you book a grab car, you can choose which grab car you want to have. You can choose just grab, share, or premium grab. And now you can do the same thing with our new product line, which is you can go out to an employment agreement, for example, and say, hey, I want something super, super basic, minimal legal coverage, and I don't have a lot of money to spare, or I just do not like long document. I want to buy the most basic document. Mm -hmm. And then our second range is the standard, which is what we think is, you know, what people would expect from a document. So for example, for employment agreements, you would expect maybe confidentiality, or you would expect that, you know, the IP would be assigned to the company, that kind of stuff. And the third is the complex document. So that one's like maximum legal coverage, the most expensive one. But you know, maybe if the founder feels super in Singapore, we call it Kiasu, they want that document. So that's the first innovation that we've made, which is like, hey, we're not going to set that price point for you anymore. You can choose from these three price points that, that, that we offer and, and you get what you pay for, which is, you know, up to you. The second thing that we're changing is we have a menu of clauses. So to the maximum extent that we can try to do this, what we do is for the basic complex and standard documents, we lay out the clauses with the key clauses that's going to be set out in the document. So when you click basic, it's not going to be like an opaque box. Mm. You're going to be looking at that basic document and you'd be like okay this is what I have now yeah. actually I have a big fear this guy that I'm employing I feel like you know he's not telling me like enough things I feel like he probably has another full-time employment contract somewhere else and you say okay this the standard or complex document cover non-compete which is what I want then okay I'll buy that one so I think that's the second key distinct feature that we have which is like you know the menu of process is laid out there for you. Yeah. And I think the distinct feature is currently most of the templates are factual questionnaires, i.e. Right. when you produce a document, the document is more or less drafted. And what they're asking you is things like, what's your name? Or what's the starting date? These are all factual questions. Currently, yeah. what we're trying to do is we're asking legal questions to figure out which document on our back end is the best for you. So to just use an example, let's use the example of a share vesting letter. For share vesting letter, it can kind of work in in three ways, broadly speaking. The first thing is you issue the shares first and then it's those shares that you issue is subject to revert. Yeah. The second way is you issue the shares only after the milestones are met, which right. is, you know, maybe like your advisor, 5% shares, you don't want to issue it so fast. He has to give you the advice first and you issue it to him. And then the kind is a bit of a complex one, but it's, it's vesting plus exit event needs to occur. Mm. So these three documents 
right? All, all these three scenarios, we all call it shared messing letter, but actually the clauses that go inside it will be different because of the mechanism that is behind it. So then we're going to ask them the question like, hey, how are these shared? What's the method of vesting that you envisage for your grantee? And then from there, we produce, give them the template that we think is a suitable one. So within the fine frameworks of what we think is right, we ask those legal questions and then we go down to the basics, which is what we try our really, really hardest best to do, which is A, we try to dumb down the terminologies. Even with our best efforts, my friends are still telling me that my videos are too technical. I try my best to like lay, like, like speak in simple English, but sometimes it's a little bit, I need to improve. And then the second thing that we still try to do our best is we try to create like a good consumer experience, which is we are not going to try to bombard them with a hundred questions. We just boil down to the key questions, which we think is going to influence the template that we think we should provide them. And from that perspective, you know, hope to just get them a document that is 75% right. If you want a hundred percent right document, you will have to then go find a lawyer. So mm. that is the thing that we're building at the moment and we're hoping to launch it this year. Amazing. And last question here is, who is the best type of customer you think for this kind of product? What kind of attributes? Yes, I think the key people we were trying to reach out to were the guys who were like raising below a million. Because when you're raising like 500,000, you can't actually justify five or $10,000 in legal fees and every penny counts. So that was the first key market I wanted to reach out to, which is, you know, people who were a bit more tight on cash. But then having this evolution also allows anyone to use it so you could be have raised three million dollars and you just want a document like maybe let's go for something a bit less complicated maybe your intern agreement right i want an intern agreement i raised two million but i don't want to find a lawyer for that then you can go to the platform you can kind of use it to generate an intern agreement that you think is to do for a company so i think it it increases transparency and it definitely gives consumers a bit more choice. But in startup terms, we call this MVP, we're a proof of concept stage. So we'll launch it. We'll see how the market responds, whether they like it or not. And then, you know, if they do like it, then we're going to do more of these FD like products. If they don't like mm. it, then we will just go for more holidays. So that's the yeah. other right side. Great. Where can we find this place? What's the hyperlink? Yeah, yeah. so on the founders.website, we do have a link that goes to FD Lite. But once we launch it, it'll be on fdlite.sg. So these templates are just uh, only for Singapore companies at the moment. Awesome. We'll make sure to hyperlink it in the transcript below as well. So on that note, I'd love to summarize the three big takeaways I got from this. First of all, thank you so much for sharing about the technology that's reshaping how lawyers are working with clients, right? So I think we talked about how, for example, ChatGPT is changing the way that are negotiating and discussing documents, but also changing how lawyers are drafting and changing these documents. Secondly, thanks for talking about the bastardization or the YC document. Mm -hmm. I guess talking about it from both sides, right? Like why it works from an economic perspective and why it works from a control rights perspective. Also taking the prism from the founder's perspective versus the angel investor perspective versus the VC perspective. Lastly, thanks so much for sharing about FD Lite. I think it ties very nicely into what you're observing that's happening across the region in terms of the goal requirements. And it's amazing that you're building out FD Lite for founders who are more lightweight approach, especially for the first million dollars of funds being raised. On that note, thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing your perspective. Thank you for having me. And it's been a wonderful session. Love to see more of your videos. And remember to subscribe to Bray Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.